Okay. Good evening, dear everybody. So we are so happy to see all of you joining from different parts of the world uh, to English Without Borders Thursday webinar. And today we are again very happy to host Lisa Mann. And Lisa Mann today, uh, she's going to talk about uh, cluster management basics. Uh, and let me just give a brief introduction uh, of Lisa Mann. Uh, Lisa Mann has been quite very active and uh, she has enjoyed a long career in the field of applied linguistics. And over the years, she has worked as an English language instructor, program director, teacher trainer, uh, and translator. In 2017, she worked with the Peruvian Ministry of Education to develop the national curriculum for English uh, for adult basic education. And in 2019, she served as an instructor and interim academic coordinator for Baxter University, an university's newly established MA TESOL program in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Um, just to note, Lisa is quite uh, famous in Central Asia because she has delivered a number of online trainings, workshops with different programs and projects. And uh, so two years later, she worked with the TESOL International Association to co-develop and co-deliver the blended TESOL course certificate program as part of Uzbekistan's English Speaking Nation Initiative, uh, which is a large scale project designed to sharpen the skills of up to 5,000 secondary school uh, English language teachers all over the country. And Lisa has worked as an English language specialist in Uzbekistan on three occasions to provide professional development workshops to university and secondary school English language instructor. And we are also very happy to have, English, uh, to have Lisa Mann as an uh, English language specialist who is also uh, doing great job by uh, assisting English Without Borders uh, Network Project. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, I'm giving the floor to you. Uh, dear participants, please uh, use this moment and write down your questions. Uh, your suggestions in the chat box. So uh, Lisa will be able to respond to them after her presentation. Thank you very much. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Nasiba, for such a nice welcome. And welcome everybody to this uh, webinar this evening. Uh, I see we have people from lots of different places here and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to Tajikistan um, or Spain or the United States or Egypt or wherever you are from. This is the wonder of the internet that we get to associate with people from all over the world. Hi, uh, Parvina, good, good, good evening. Well, today we're going to be talking about uh, classroom management and classroom management basics. Now, some of these things that we talk about today might be quite um, obvious to you, especially if you've been teaching for a very long time. But uh, sometimes we forget uh, some of the basics that, uh, that we may have learned when we were learning to be teachers. And it's good always to review and to reflect a little bit about our practice and ask, ask ourselves what we might do differently and what we might do better, right? To, uh, to, better, to, to improve our teaching and to improve our students' learning. So let's look at our objectives for today. I'm just gonna put that there. Sorry, one sec. So today we're going to discuss some major components of classroom uh, management. Now classroom management is a huge topic and there's a lot to be said and a lot to be learned about uh, classroom management and what it involves. Um, and at the end of this webinar, I'll give you some wonderful references you can use if you want to delve a little bit deeper beyond the basics that we talk about in this webinar. But some of the major components of classroom management we'll talk about today are establishing routines and procedures, uh, giving clear instructions, monitoring student work, and developing a set of gestures or signals to use uh, when you are managing your classes. So throughout the webinar, I'll ask you to uh, participate several times and ask you, ask you some questions. Uh, please type your answers in the chat 
And uh, whether you're joining us from Facebook or here on Zoom, uh, the Facebook questions will be transmitted to us and we can, or trans the Facebook answers will be transmitted to us and we can uh, share them here on Zoom and we'll discuss all together and share our ideas and our experiences, okay? All right, so let's get started. So first of all, we might want to just make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what a classroom management problem is. Um, and we could say uh, that a classroom management problem could be defined as any event, behavior, pattern, feeling, or thought that keeps us from being able to teach our teach to our fullest potential or keeps our class from learning in the most liberated, satisfying and effective manner. And this is from a book called Transformative Classroom Management that um, really talks about how to make our students succeed, right? And part of success in, in school and, and success in academia is uh, being in a classroom that is well managed, that you can think in, that you can perform in, and that you can uh, effectively learn in. So classroom management is about, really about allowing our students to learn, about setting the condition the best conditions for learning that we possibly can. But there are all kinds of problems that happen with classroom management, right? Um, what are some of the classroom management problems that you've faced? Now, classroom management problems could be lots of different things. Oops, I just did something there. Um, from a lot of noise to oof, even to fighting in your classroom. It could be that you don't, your students don't get into groups well. It could be that they don't, they speak only in, in L1, they only speak in their own language. But when you ask a question to the class, nobody answers, right? There are all kinds of problems that could come up in classroom management. So can you tell me in the chat, what are some kinds of problems uh, with classroom management that you have faced in your classes. Of course, the types of problems we have will differ on who we teach, right? Young teachers of young learners will have different classroom management problems than teachers of a university or our secondary school students. Okay, good time management, mobile playing, good. So people taking out their phones and playing with that. A lack of concentration and focus. Thank you, Natia. Yeah, exactly. And a lack of motivation, perhaps, is that's a big classroom management problem. Nobody wants to do anything, right? A lack of interest. Good. All of these, yeah, bad behavior, yeah, sort of showing off or making up. Lazy learners, Mati, uh, is it Ali? Ali says lazy learners who don't want to uh, participate. Now, as we walk through uh, the next few slides where we look at a few scenarios and try to think what, could we, what we would do in each of these situations, it's important to think about reflecting on our own practice and what we can do about these problems. So in, instead of seeing it as a problem with a student, we might want to think about, well, is there anything I am not doing or anything I'm doing too much of that maybe uh, could be at the root cause of these problems, yeah? So um, I'm just gonna read these a few different, different levels of student knowledge. So that's definitely um, a classroom management issue is a different, different uh, levels of proficiency in the same group. Uh, somebody, well, somebody just uh, posted the quote that I just uh, that I just shared. <laughs> that quote is from a, a book that I have. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you have that book too, or else you you found it. That's excellent. Um, so, uh, differing levels. There are lots of classroom management problems that are uh, we have to deal with that we have really very little control over, but. So huge classes, really numerous 
uh, groups of students, uh, differing levels of proficiency. But as teachers, we have to deal with what we have, right? And we have to make the best of the situation that we are in. And we'll talk about some of the things we can do um, as we go on. So noise is one of the ones that people talk about a lot. Um, uh, Parvina, I think uh, we might make a, a difference between uh, good noise and bad noise, right? If our students are speaking English and they are communicating with one another and they're excited about what they're talking about, it, 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 you, you almost don't want to stop that, right? Because uh, at least they are practicing the language and they're becoming more um, fluent, right? It's creative noise, right? It's positive noise. Uh, and we might differentiate that from bad noise when the students are speaking in L1, when they are um, sort of fighting, when they're off task, they're talking about something that has nothing to do with your lesson. Um, so we might want to just make that distinction as we go, go on between sort of good creative noise, uh, noise that comes from being excited about speaking and learning English and some bad noise, which is from um, being bored and doing something different, right? Okay. So let's look at a couple of different scenarios and, um, and then we'll talk about uh, what happened here and what could be done. So this is the first scenario. So you're super excited about a group activity that you think your students will like, right? So we all get excited and that's one of the joys of being a teacher. You find an activity and you think, oof, my students are gonna love this. So you, the activity is that you want your students to work in groups and create a plan for a new park, yeah? So you give the instructions and you tell the students to form groups of four. The students make a huge amount of noise and take a very long time moving to their groups. And when the groups are finally formed, some of the groups are completely silent and some are chattering in Tajik or Russian or Georgian, whatever their first language is. And some have one or two people who are speaking and dominating the conversation and the others aren't doing anything at all. So you are disappointed already. You've just started this project and, and already it's starting to fail. Now, what do you think? What could have gone wrong here in this scenario? So that the students get to the, you think they're gonna love the lesson. Uh, they make a ton of noise getting into their groups and then they kind of don't do anything once they get to their groups. What, what maybe is the problem here? Good, Natia says maybe the instructions weren't very clear. Yeah, good. Anything else? Maybe the instructions were too long. Yeah, okay, that's possible. Yeah, good, anything else? No demo, all right, good. All right, now we're getting to the, the, the bottom of it. The, team, the teams maybe aren't, um, aren't set up correctly. Although in this scenario, this scenario, it, they are allowed to choose their teams. So maybe not everybody liked the activity. I guess that's possible. I think this is a pretty engaging activity. Let's take a look at some possibilities. Maybe the students don't know what you expect when you ask them to form groups, yeah? And this has to do with routines and procedures. Now, uh, routines and procedures are a key part of classroom management. And if you do a little bit of deeper reading on classroom management, and I hope that you do, I'll give you some references, as I say at the end. Uh, scholars and, and, and researchers talk again and again about establishing routines and procedures. Uh, routines are things that the students will need to do over and over uh, during the school year. And there are lots of things that we do again and again, yeah? So handing in or correcting homework, uh, writing in their notebooks, uh, 
asking questions, right? Do you want them to raise their hand or just speak out? Do you want them to raise their hand and then you call on them? Like, how, are, how do you want them to signal that they have a question, right? Uh, how do you want them to compare their work with the partner? Yeah, these are things that we do again and again. And if the students don't have a routine for this and a procedure, then they just, it's just chaos. They do it differently every time and they aren't sure what to do. And in the last example, uh, getting into groups, um, which is something that uh, we, we do a lot in the English language classroom, or we should, uh, collaborative learning is such an important part. It's anything that you regularly do in your class. Now procedures are the steps involved in a routine. And routines and procedures become increasingly important in large classrooms, right? Because uh, we don't want to have to micromanage all of these very common actions in the classroom. We want them to work like clockwork, we say. We want them to just happen. Uh, but they can't just happen unless we train our students how to do them, right? So procedures have to be taught. Yeah, you have to teach a procedure. You can't just expect for it to happen. Uh, and just saying what they have to do is usually not enough, right? As we all learn by doing, right? We all learn by actually doing the thing we're trying to learn. So we need to practice the procedure before we expect our students to be able to do it. So one, uh, way to think about it is to say it, see it, check it, do it, right? So this is how we might teach a procedure, for example, for getting into groups. So first we say it, and we might say something like this. We're going to make seven groups, and these gestures are important, and we'll talk about those in a minute. We're going to make seven groups, one for every day of the week. The Mondays will sit here, the Tuesdays will sit here, the Wednesdays will sit here. You need to bring your book, your notebook, and your pencil. And when I say move, you have 30 seconds to gather your things and quietly move to your group. Now, that's the say it part. So I've said it, but who knows who has understood, right? Who knows who is paying attention? Who knows who caught all of that information? You might model next so they can see it by being a Monday, picking up your three things and moving quietly and quickly to the space reserved for the Mondays. Yeah? Now they've you've heard it and they've seen it. And now you have to check it by asking what are called instruction check questions or ICQs. We ask these almost every time we give an instruction unless it's part of our routine. We might ask, okay, so where are the Wednesdays going to sit, right? And they point, where, what about the Fridays? Where are the Fridays going to sit? Yeah? When will you move to your group? Yeah? When you say move, how many seconds do you have to get into your group? 30, right? And are you gonna make a lot of noise? Quietly, right? And then this is the most important part. So we've seen, we've said it, we've seen it, we've checked it, and now you need to rehearse it. You need to practice it. So you get them into groups. Let's say our days of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. Uh, and then move, have them do it, yeah? Once they're in their groups, you can give them feedback on that process. And if necessary, if they do it terribly, do it again, right? So you have to train your students to do these procedures. You can't expect them to just know how to make a group, know how to go uh, to their different groups and quietly and quickly. Uh, you have to time them. This is important when in that trans in those transitions from individual work to group work to finding a partner, all of that needs super clear procedure and routine that they already know. And this is a way um, uh, to just make sure that you are doing all of the steps uh, in the training process, right? And then the next time they do it, they will remember how you did it last time. And they, you'll give these instructions. You don't have to model it again. Uh, you ask your ICQs and they're off, right? So you don't have to model it more than once. You don't have to rehearse it this time. Yeah, but then it runs more smoothly the next few times you do it. All right. 
in this scenario, maybe the students don't know what they what they're supposed to do. And that's a really common problem, a uh, common source of classroom management pro uh, problems. The students aren't sure what they're being asked to do, right? Um, uh, and this is even more true in the language classroom because we're frequently giving instructions in English, yeah? I know a lot of you give your instructions in your first language, but I would encourage you to try uh, giving instructions in English at least the first time. Um, if it's really, they really aren't getting it, then you might switch to L1. But uh, the more input they get in, from you in English, and in English as a foreign language situation where they're not hearing English in the street, um, you're their only source of real, authentic English language. It's, uh, it's a good opportunity to um, especially since you're saying the same type of things again and again, they get that repetition and they'll start to understand a little bit better. It increases their uh, English comprehension. All right. So giving clear instructions can help avoid problems like your students using a lot of their first language, like being off task or just sitting there in silence wondering, what are we supposed to do, <laughs> right? So who can give me type one tip for giving clear instructions in the chat box. If you wanted to give a tip for giving clear instructions, what would you say? What would your advice be? Anyone have a tip for me? Okay, good, uh, Guru, use imperatives. Yes, exactly, good. Sit down, stand up, yeah, move to your group. Be short and specific. Excellent, Nadia. Anything else? What if you have a kind of a complicated little activity, a complicated project? Demo, thank you, Gulnora. The keywords are demo. Always give an example demo what you expect them to do. Good. If you need to draw in some other students to do that, you can. Good. Yeah, you can draw in some more active ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make them uh, busy. Well, you were in the instructions, keeping the uh, just for the instructions, a tip for clear instructions. Model. Ali says, that's exactly right. Okay, so let's look at some of my, um, uh, uh, some of my advice. Um, one of the things that we need to think about when we're planning our lesson, and especially if we're going a little bit sort of, we might say off, off script, we're doing something that we don't usually do, something that may be a little bit tricky, uh, is to just think about it, how you're going to explain the instructions. How are you going to give the instructions before the class? So don't just sort of get up and improvise, uh, but think about what am I going to say, or even write it down. How am I going to explain this in English so that they understand uh, what they have to do? Um, predict some uh, possible comprehension problems. Yeah, what, uh, where might they misunderstand what they're supposed to do, and incorporate uh, solutions uh, to those comprehension problems into your instructions. One of the things that, uh, that sometimes I fail to do, uh, and that is, again, why we're looking at these basics, even though many of us are experienced teachers, is that it's good to review these because sometimes you just forget, you move on, you, you forget to do these things. One of the important things is to clearly separate instruction from other talk, okay? So that means pausing, telling them that you're going to give instructions, calling their attention to you, making sure that they understand these are the instructions for what we're going to do now. Yeah, this is not just me continuing to talk. Yeah. Long instructions should be written out the, on the board, but it try to keep your instructions and keep them short by using imperatives, by using very short sentences. And it's in your brain, you think of a bullet pointed list, uh, even write that on the board. One, two, three, four. These are the steps we're going to do. We're going to form groups. You're going to sit with the Mondays or the Tuesdays or the Wednesdays. You're going to open your book, right? So those kinds of long instructions, maybe you want to write on the board. That's also good for visual learners who learn a bit better that way. Model, and many of us have said this, and this is so key, modeling so that they see what they're supposed to do. Otherwise, they aren't going to have an idea. Um, they may have understood it fully, but they may not have. 
And lastly, check that they've understood with inst in instruction check questions or ICQs. Yeah. Things like, okay, how much time do you have? Yeah. Who is going to sit over here? <laughs> yeah. uh, do you need to bring your book? <laughs> All those kinds of questions, just to check that everyone has understood. And the kids who haven't understood hear from the other ones now the second time the answer to those questions, the second time they hear those instructions. So they um, get more uh, uh, confirmation of what they maybe didn't understand so well. Another possibility uh, is that maybe the students uh, for that scenario, maybe the students are embarrassed about speaking because they might make mistakes. Um, remember in the scenario, there were some groups who were just sitting there silently. Well, maybe they were all embarrassed to speak English together. They didn't want to do it. And speaking in another language is embarrassing. <laughs> we all know, we all speak more than one language. It can be really embarrassing. It can be really intimidating, especially in front of people who you don't know well or you aren't comfortable with. Right? Um, if you've ever had to give a presentation in English or, uh, or meet a group of people whose English was super high level and you felt embarrassed, that's normal, it's natural. Yeah? So, it's important that we create in our classes a, a sense of community where everyone sort of feels part of the same team and everyone wants everyone else to succeed. Uh, and, and everyone, there's, there's a sense of safety and a sense that you can take a risk here and try to speak English. And it doesn't matter if you're great or if you make a lot of mistakes, I'm glad you're trying, right? Some ways to build a classroom community is to know your students and make sure they know each other. So everybody likes it when, for example, you've probably heard the, um, the expression um, that students do better when they like their teacher and when they think that their teacher likes them. So I guess that's not an expression. I think it's a fact. Uh, students do better when they like their teacher and when they think that their teacher likes them. Now, one way that you can show that you like a student is to know about their lives and ask them things. Yeah? How was your basketball game yesterday, Fernando? Or yeah, uh, how, did your, um, how did your weekend go? Or what are you doing tomorrow? Or I saw you had a new bike. That's really nice, you know? So asking, taking an interest in them and making sure they know each other through activities like interviewing one another, personalizing the lessons so that they have to speak about themselves. And this is blurring or, or sort of rubbing out that authority and the, the strong and the weak and the sort of cool, but a, a less, uh, a, a doesn't know anything, right? So that, and you do that by involving your students in every step of the learning process by asking uh, instead of telling, yeah? so like not giving them a lecture, but asking them to tell you, allowing them to participate all throughout the lesson, yeah, the whole time, even if you're teaching grammar, even if you're teaching something that they've never heard before, you can ask them to help you teach it. An important one is to have some fun together sometime. Purpose. They can be uh, games that teach something, that learn something, that review something, that recycle something, but fun games where they laugh together and then you laugh with them, yeah. Give meaningful praise. What do you think meaningful praise? Type your answer in the chat. What does meaningful praise mean? Constructive, yes, yeah? Yeah, okay, good, Nadia, good job, yeah? That, just good, not, and not just saying good job to end, that they, everyone feels uh, that it loses its importance, right? So giving process praise, thank you very much. Choose something specific that the learner has done and you praise them for that, right? So um, you can say, for example, oh, I like very much how you've uh, used so many posters, really nice. I especially like this aspect of it, right? So you relate it exactly to a specific achievement that they've done, a specific, um, uh, point in their learning that you have noticed. This makes them feel that you have noticed them. You're not, they're just not another learner to you. You notice them specifically and that feels good, right? It makes them want to improve and makes them want to work uh, to, to get more of that specific process, meaningful praise. And you can encourage peer feedback that begins with praise. And a lot of people shy away from peer feedback, especially in secondary schools, because kids can be mean, they can be cruel, right? Um, but if you give them a procedure 
for for giving feedback that begins always with praise. Um, what did you like about this presentation? Or what did you like about this student's work? Um, that's very powerful to hear that from a peer, from a colleague, from a classmate. You know, oh, I like your story. I like the ending, you know, something like that. Good. Another part of building community is keeping in mind that mistakes are part of the process, that everybody knows that everybody feels comfortable uh, making mistakes. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. And this also is part of blurring that master learner dichotomy by not always correcting every mistake that people make, but being very judicious, very careful about which mistakes you correct and when. Yeah. Another way to build community is to work on a class project to get everyone involved in working towards some final product that they can feel a part of and then they can feel proud of at the end. And because you have so many people working together at once, the project can be quite complex. Yeah, you can do something really important and really authentic and meaningful. So class projects are a wonderful way to build a sense of uh, community. Okay, another possibility for that scenario was that maybe the students didn't know what they should do in their small groups. Maybe they weren't sure what they, their role was. And in truly collaborative work and truly collaborative activities, everyone has a role to play. There's accountability. Everybody is responsible for something. So giving your students specific responsibilities is one way to make sure that everyone participates. They have to, that's their, they have to participate or else the whole team will fail, right? So they have this joint sense of responsibility for the success of the group. In the park planning activity from our scenario we read earlier, um, you might say that everyone has to contribute ideas, but they might decide in their group uh, that they're uh, to assign four different roles. You might ask them to assign four roles, one to each of the four people in the group. One person, for example, could be an idea collector, and this would be a person to lead an idea brainstorm. One person could be a discussion leader, a person to lead the discussion to choose the best ideas. One person can be a participation monitor, and I love this idea. I've seen this in action, it's quite good. Uh, it is a person to invite all group members to share their ideas. Now, they'll need some training on this a little bit, yeah, before you just throw them these roles. But a participation monitor says things like, um, Parvina, what do you think? <laughs> She's, if Parvina isn't saying anything, or um, Firuz, we haven't heard from you yet. What do you think we should do? Right. So they, uh, if they have these roles, if these roles become part of your routine, part of your group work, your collaborative work routine, um, then they know what they should do. They have maybe some sentence stems that help them. Um, to successfully fulfill their role. And they won't just sit there in their group and not participate. They have something to do. Everyone has something to do. And then the park planning activity, you might also have someone who's the architect. So a person to lead the drawing aspect of it. Because you know the, the activity is that they design a park and also draw it on a poster or something. So that, that part of the design part also needs someone to lead it. Although everyone can color and everyone can draw in the, the design, someone has to help lead that section. So if the students are staying in their groups and some of them aren't participating, give them a job to do. Yeah, give them something to do. All right, another possibility might be that maybe the students don't expect you to monitor them. So sometimes students think of group work as like free time. <laughs> so a time when nobody's watching them and they aren't being held accountable for their work. They can do whatever they want. I'm with my three friends. We're just going to talk about football. Uh, and the teacher won't even know because she's at her desk correcting papers or <laughs> trying to plan her next lesson or whatever. Um, and sometimes it just it means that some people don't uh, participate. Sometimes it means that some whole groups don't do anything. They don't do what you're asking them to do. Uh, and that's because you're not monitoring. And regular monitoring and intervention when necessary um, can prevent this problem. 
So when your students are doing group work, how do you monitor them? Yeah, how, what do you do when, when your students are working in groups? What, where are you and what are you doing? Type your answers in the chat. How do you monitor group work? Observing Karus, yeah, good. Visiting each group, thank you Munira. Yes, visiting each group, good. Go around and check and help, yeah, good. Keeping time, yeah, good. Anything else? There are lots of great strategies for uh, monitoring uh, group work. Uh, let's take a look at a few. Most of the time with group work, uh, it tends to be unobtrusive. In other words, you don't go in and join the group. Um, you might sometimes, but it, it, I like to just sort of stand behind and listen, make sure they're on task, make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, and then move on to the next one if everything seems to be going well. Sometimes I might write down uh, in my notebook some errors that I heard to, uh, to talk about later at the end, but I wouldn't interrupt the group work to correct errors. That's a way to shut them down immediately, right? So maybe take some notes about errors you hear, um, maybe feed them some vocabulary that they seem to be searching for, but they can't put their finger on, things like that. But, quite unobtrusive, yeah, not, inter not intervening, not interrupting unless it's necessary. And sometimes it is necessary. Sometimes they're doing the wrong thing. <laughs> you go, no, 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 no. You're not supposed to, you know, you're not supposed to write a summary or you're not supposed to write a report about a park. You're supposed to design a park. And they go, oh, <laughs> right. So sometimes you must intervene because they don't, they clearly haven't understand what they're, haven't understood what they're supposed to do. All right, so let's look at a, a good Parvina stay at a few every, at each group for a few minute, minutes and then move on. Yeah, good one. Yeah. So when you put students in group uh, groups, the first minute is crucial, right? They're deciding who their roles are, you know, who has which role. They are talking about what they're supposed to do. They're sort of figuring out what's going to happen next and making some plans. So this is when you really want to go around and make sure everybody's understood, right? Everyone's doing the right thing. And there are lots of different ways you can do it. I, I like to monitor sort of discreetly, to sort of stand behind and, and just listen and see if, see if I hear anything going wrong or if I hear things that are really going super well. And, uh, and then when I'm confident that the group is working well together and they're on task, move to the next group. But you can also sort of vanish. And this is a, a way, especially with higher level groups, uh, to just give them some freedom to, to work on their own. And that means maybe standing uh, in the back of the room and where no one can really see you and just sort of watching around and how it's all going um, to just become invisible, right? And just let them, uh, let them carry on. Uh, and maybe from there you see something going wrong and you have to go over and, and just listen and check that everything's going right. But just giving them that freedom of working without the teacher constantly uh, constantly monitoring them is, is, also, is also effective sometimes. You can actively monitor where you sort of jump in and intervene, like I say, giving uh, if they if if they seem to be struggling quite a lot, um, and this depends on the situation, depends on uh, what what they're working on and how well they're doing. They participate, just pull up a chair and join a group, right? And join them for a few minutes uh, and be a part of their group and help them. For example, if they're not generating a lot of ideas, uh, a place to skate to do skateboarding. What about that? Would you like that? Then you know, sort of guide them to generate more and more ideas. Sometimes that's necessary because they aren't thinking very, uh, do it very well. So monitoring uh, group work is just as important as the group work, uh, as the instructions. If you give the instructions, you don't just digging around and making sure everyone's on task and everyone knows what to do. Okay, so let's look at scenario two. In scenario two, now you've, everyone in park, yeah? everyone's in their groups working happily and they're on task. Everyone is doing the task, they're doing the activity. 
you're maybe a little high and you're worried about possibly disturbing other classes. You try shouting, guys, kids, listen up, <laughs> listen, <laughs> but only a few groups pay attention. You decide to end the attention and you end up shouting and try, kids, guys, everyone, listen, and nobody's looking at you. And finally you shout, stop, everybody look at me. You get angry, <laughs> you lose it for a minute and just shout, the, shout at them to, to stop working and look at you. Now your students fall silent and the excitement about the lesson, the, all of the, uh, all of the, the, the happy and, and excited use of English that they were doing just a few minutes before completely disappears. Now you've shouted at them, you've ruined it, you've ruined the mood. Um, so tell me, what could you have done differently here? What could, what could you have done to make this a little bit more successful? And this sort of catching everyone's attention. Any ideas? Shouting is always, as Matthias say, shouting is a huge mistake. Even if you're not shouting in anger, even if you're just shouting over the, the, the students to try to calm them down, uh, it's still, you're just adding to the noise, right? It's, you're just it, you're making the problem even worse. Yeah, good. Some attention getters. Good, Zibo. Do you have an idea? Can you can you tell us what that means? What's a good attention getter? Which one do you use, or ones? Which attention getters do you use? Any ideas? Ah, good. Hear me clap. Good. If you hear me clap, maybe once, or maybe they have a rhythm that they do, right? Or yeah, and then they clap back. Yeah. Waterfall, what's that one, Zebo? What's the waterfall one? I don't know that. Uh, Lisa, can I talk? Yes. Uh, uh, I remember I was teaching and uh, I had a person who observed my class and uh, when I was teaching access students and I had a foreigner who observed and when we, we students were in task, we gave uh, uh, when gave five minutes, but students didn't listen when we say stop. Uh, now you have to present. Nobody listened to us, and we have to stop it as you say. Okay, finished. And then uh, at the end, we had a feedback from a foreigner said that your students do not listen to you. So you need some activities like att attention, uh, um, how to. Attention uh, getters. Mm -hmm. Attention getters. Like waterfall, like uh, you, your hands up and you are moving like uh, ah, waving. Yeah. Uh, waterfall and uh -huh, you are okay. and everybody. So you have to act it and the students will look at you. Right, okay. Waterfall. All right. So, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, I don't know that one, but yeah. Anything that, that you've established as an attention getter with your class, it could be clapping, it could be some kind of movement. Some people just raise their hand. A noise meter in class. Uh, sometimes people put up a, a, a card, like in football. So they put up a, a yellow card, or they put up a, a, a yellow, red, or green card. Um, and those mean things like, you're getting a little too loud, you're OK, or red, stop, something like that. Um, but uh, uh, a good, well, a, I, we're talking, uh, Natia, about trying to get the whole class's attention when everybody's talking to each other in small groups, right? And we know shouting isn't very good. A whistle or a bell might be a good idea, clapping. Yeah, a silent strategy, you could just raise your hand like this and ask everyone to pay attention, right? That everyone, when they see you going like this, they also have to put their hand up like this. However, uh, sometimes that takes a long time, yeah? So what I usually do when the light, when it's too loud in a class is I flick the lights, yeah? So that, it, that I'm not adding to the noise, but there's a visual clue that um, you're being too loud, yeah? Keep the, the, the uh, noise down. Now this, again, you have to train your learners to understand what that means. Otherwise, they, they just continue on. But all of this classroom management is about training your learners to, to, to work well together in the classroom so they can all, um, they can all learn, yeah? So flicking the lights, clapping, but having some kind of routine signal or gesture. 
Let's take a look at some other gestures you might, might use. So teachers, and we all have this, we have this sort of repertoire of gestures and signals that your students know and they recognize. Yeah? Um, if you've ever asked your students to do an imitation of you or to act like you, you've probably seen them do these gestures to you, right? Um, so you, you just start at the beginning of the year by doing the gestures and telling them what they mean. Um, and they get used to it and they, they, sudden, they slowly catch on when you do this, you want them to be quiet, right? Or this means look at me, right? Some people have little rhymes that they say, one, two, three, eyes on me, right? They have all of these, there are lots of different attention getters, um, but they very often involve some kind of audio or visual signal or, uh, and, and, or a hand gesture, a, a physical gesture. So let's just, um, I, we're gonna run out of time because we don't wanna spend too much time on this, but I'd like to see, um, I'm gonna put your pictures here so I can see you. And I'd like to see um, what hand gesture would you use for these different common classroom commands? So how would you ask your students to stand up? So show me if you have your camera on, show me what you would do for your students to stand up. What hand gesture would you use? You might go like this. Okay, everybody stand up. Yeah, you might just raise your hand. Everybody stand up. And this is a really common one in the classroom, right? Let's see, no one's putting their camera on. That's okay, I'll just do them myself. <laughs> okay, another one is um, work in pairs and you might just have something like this. You go, okay, I want you to work in pairs. Or I want you to work with your shoulder partner. Yeah, something like that. These, again, they take training. Yeah? You have to do it more than once. You have, they have to become a part of your routine yeah, for them to know. Uh, five minutes left, you might say, okay, or you might go, five minutes, right? You just have a signal for that. Yeah? And quiet down, what do you use for quiet down? What hand signal would you use for quiet down? You can type in the chat if you want. Anybody? You could say that, but just, yeah, your hands down like this. Okay. Yeah, or maybe like this, just like this. Is that what you meant for Ruth? Yeah, put your finger to your lip. All right, guys. Yeah, quiet down. What kind of signal could you use for attention getting? Stop talking and look at me. Well, we just talked about these a moment ago. So clapping, doing some kind of hand gesture, just raising your hand like that. Look at me. Yeah, everybody look at me. Oh yeah, good, listen to me. Okay, listen to me. Yeah, good. <laughs> Not, yeah. yeah, that was good. Listen to her. Now, if you if someone else is talking and it's not you, somebody else is giving a presentation, maybe you, the, the person who's not listening, you catch their eye, you give them the shh, be quiet, and you point at the person who's talking. Shh. Listen to her. Shh. Yeah. You just use all these little signals. We all do it. And I know you're thinking now, probably you weren't even aware that you use all of these gestures in your classroom, but you do. Sometimes the students give a really short answer. What did you do last weekend? Nothing. Yeah, so you might just <laughs> give them a, give them, come on, tell me a little bit more. Yeah, you might use your finger like this to say, give me a little bit more. What else did you do? Come on. And stop talking now. Sometimes, you know, when you have students who really dominate and they talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, how can, what gesture do you use to ask them to, to stop. I just did it it's sort of just naturally, but what do you do? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give someone else a try. Yeah, you just hold your hand up maybe. Yeah. Show a zipper. Be quiet. I don't know. I think that may be a little bit strong. That might be a little rude. Judith, Judith uh, says raising your hand. That's what I do too, Judith. Yeah. <laughs> And what about if you're doing an information gap and you you want your each person, I keep doing it for you in, instead of asking me before I before I ask you to tell me, you don't want your partners to show each other their papers because one person has 
some information and their partner has different information. So what kind of gesture could you use for that? What do you think? Yes, like this, like this, it's a secret. Don't show your partner, it's a secret, right? So you hold it, you're a thing like this. And that is using all of these wonderful emoticons to show us what she means. Yeah, so don't show, it's a secret. Yeah, don't show your partner. So all of these kinds of gestures and signals that we establish these, I guess, yeah. In Spain, this is a very common um, gesture that people use all the time. It means no, 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 no. Um, all of these, we establish them as we go along, but we especially establish them at the beginning of our, class, of our courses. Okay, so to sum up, um, sometimes things go wrong in our classes and it happens, it happens all the time and it's completely normal. But if things seem to always go wrong or seem to go wrong very often and you're just pulling your hair out, maybe it's time to look a little bit at yourself, to reflect a little bit at your own practices and look for places where maybe you can make a difference through your classroom practice, through your own teaching. Yeah? Some ways that we might prevent problems from happening include uh, it creating an encouraging classroom community where, where everyone feels safe, everyone feels comfortable, uh, everyone feels like they're part of the same team, right? They feel like we're all working towards this thing uh, together, yeah? And they're not shy in front of you, they're not shy in front of their, their peers. You can develop routines and procedures for common classroom actions like getting into groups or sitting with pairs or opening books or all kinds of things. You can work on giving clear instructions so everyone knows what they're supposed to do. In group works, you can assign, you can assign roles. So when everyone knows what they're supposed to do, everyone has a responsibility and the success of the group depends on the success of every single person in the group. And you can monitor in lots of different ways by sort of, you know, walking around, by standing at the back, by sitting down with them um, to, uh, to help. So these are very basic ideas for classroom management. This webinar is called Classroom Management Basics. And we all know much of these things, but it's very important to to revisit it from time to time, because the next time you are faced with a classroom management situation, you might remember, oh yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, I, maybe my instructions weren't so clear, maybe I should do that again, or oh, I, you know, I didn't model that, maybe I should have modeled that. You can become a little bit more reflective about your practice. If you'd like to find out more, ah, sorry, <laughs> there was one more, <laughs> using gestures and signals for common classroom commands, which we just did. If you'd like to find out more about classroom management, there's a, a ton of literature on the subject. And these are just a few of the re references and resources that I used uh, in preparing this presentation. Um, and now I guess Nasiba will take questions. If anyone has any questions that I, I hope I can answer, I, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa, for such very detailed uh, presentation. So you shared lots of tips and lots of recommendations. And I'm sure like, you know, uh, everybody got uh, some new ideas from today's webinar. Thank you very much, Lisa. And yes, we, we are going to open the floor for questions and answers. So please, dear audience, uh, feel free to uh, write down your questions in the chat box, or you can just unmute yourself and ask your questions. All those who are watching us via Facebook, just the same, you can put your questions in the comment box. So we'll be forwarding those uh, to Lisa. So, uh, okay, we have the first question. Uh, in your experience, what has been the most challenging part of uh, classroom management? Well, uh, in my experience, uh, I taught um, in a sort of an afternoon, uh, an afternoon course, after school course in uh well I'll, I'll, i have lots of experience lots of experiences to share but i'll just choose one in peru and these kids they they weren't with their regular their regular class right so they they didn't know each other very well so it was challenging 
and, and I came in in the middle of the year. That's an important point. I came in in the middle of the year. So it was challenging to sort of develop a classroom community from the middle of the year with kids who didn't spend the day together, came from different schools and different backgrounds. Um, and, and so that can be hard. And, and, um, and in that particular case, it was very book bound the class. The curriculum was very much based on the book. And uh, there was very little time to do sort of the kinds of things I would normally do at the beginning of the year uh, at that time. So it was, that was a challenge for me. Challenging, it was challenging to create a classroom community in a, an existing classroom um, that's very much book bound, that you, you have a very strict schedule to follow. Um, so, and that has to do with time, managing your time, finding the time to create, uh, to build community, yeah. Okay, good, Natia, I like your question. I have fast finisher, finishers and they often make noise and disturb others. I don't always have extra work for them. Any advice? Well, if you don't have extra work for them, <laughs> they could, you know, they could maybe make uh, a, vocabulary list on the board, for example, if they're doing a reading, uh, you could have just a few mm, not work that you give them, so not, you know, sort of handouts, but a few strategies that you always ask. Like if you finish early, you can start creating some flashcards with the vocabulary from today for us to revise next time. Or if you finish early, um, you can help me to um, you know, correct some of this homework if it's just a sort of yes, no, discrete answer homework. So I don't know that that's a hard one, but you do have to have some strategies. There will always be people who finish first um, and there, you have to have something in mind for them to do. Yeah. Yeah. How do you manage time, handle time management when the class is excited with some games? Uh, many times they, they do get super excited about games and they should, it's fun, right? And if the game is educational, that's fantastic. But we do have usually a curriculum that we have to follow, a syllabus that we have to stick to. Um, and you just have to promise to do the game again really soon. I'm glad you like that, wonderful. We're gonna do that again next week, but right now we're gonna do something else also fun. <laughs> <laughs> good. If there are over 25 students, good. Yeah, that's a whole different um, story <laughs> because uh, large classrooms are notoriously hard to handle. Um, but there are lots of different ways you can set up the classroom so that they have, for example, home groups that they always go back to. And in those home groups, they each have roles that they play. Um, uh, and those roles switch from week to week or every uh, few days. Um, it's a, it, there's a lot to say about that, Nazir, and I'm, I can't really go into it now. Um, but yeah, the uh, home groups is a good way to start, yeah, to, by putting people who to always sit in the same place with the same six or seven people. and then. They, these are your many classrooms, right? And you strategically group them um, based on their proficiency level or their um, their personal characteristics, like outgoing or shy. Uh, yeah, good lesson planning, Gulmoro, is definitely helps you to manage the classroom because you start to think about what could go wrong, right? As you're planning a lesson, you're, you're constantly thinking, okay, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna explain this? How is this gonna work if we only have 45 minutes, right? Like how much time do I need for this and that? So yeah, good lesson planning is key. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. You do your best and nothing seems to work. <laughs> what should you do? Gosh, it takes a lot of reflection then, uh, Fernando, just to think what went wrong and just go back, you know, moment by moment and see. I, I don't know if you've ever seen yourself teach, if anyone has ever video recorded you teaching, but it's an eye opener. Um, it really shows you some of the things that maybe you didn't realize you were doing um, and and maybe those things uh, contribute somehow to the chaos yeah 
maybe you talk too much, or maybe you mumble, or maybe you know you intervene too much. All of those things. A good way is to to watch yourself teach, record yourself, have someone record you. And is there a certificate for this webinar? I don't think so, right, Nasima? No. Yeah. So it's actually we recommend other followers to you know to stay tuned on us and follow the posts we usually publish because we usually. Uh, announce in advance if we have any upcoming uh, webinars or tra online trainings with certificates. So please uh, don't miss uh, this chance and uh, start following our social media pages. And also we have like a uh, raised hand, so up hurry, so uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. No, I don't think he's no. going to. Yeah, OK. All right. So anyway, yeah, uh, so uh, the time is quickly running. So we enjoyed the webinar. Thank you a lot, uh, Lisa, for sharing just very great teaching tips with us today. Uh, and dear audience, uh, again, we extend our huge gratitude for your active participation. And it one, once again proves that you are all very passionate teachers uh, who are joining this webinar because we really consider that there is no borders between the teachers and English Without Borders is very happy to provide its platform for webinars for teachers to get together and to build online community. Thank you very much for joining this webinar and uh, our followers who are watching us on Zoom and Facebook, please don't forget to join us for our next exciting webinar. So, if you are planning to have a career boost and if you want to apply for exchange programs, so please watch our uh, tomorrow webinar with one of our uh, uh, USG alumni who are currently residing in Georgia, USA, and she will be sharing useful tips how to apply for exchange programs and save your career uh, to have great professional development abroad. Thank you very much. Uh, so please join us tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, Tajikistan time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye bye. Everyone, Have a thank great you. evening. Bye bye.